Hey, Bookmatic Lifelong Learners. We have a great guest here for the Bookmatic Best Books podcast. Uh, it's Joe Wimble Groves, the author of Rise of the Girl, Seven Empowering Conversations to Have with Your Daughter. And, uh, you know, I'm a father myself, so I got this book specifically for that reason. I have a daughter who is five years old, and uh, a lot of Joe's stories really relate uh, with any parent out there with daughters. So, Joe, thanks for coming on the podcast. Thank you so much for having me, Matt. It's it's an absolute pleasure, and it's just lovely to see you online. It's great, and yeah, be able to share more about the book. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. I mean, uh, I really love having authors from a wide variety of backgrounds with lots of different uh, topics. So, and I think you're you're one of my first guests that has an actual parenting book. So this is really exciting to, I mean, I, I've got a whole stack of parenting books. So uh, hopefully all the listeners out there will like this topic because um, of course there's a lot of parents out there. So um, yeah, so can you uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, maybe a little bit of your background and uh, introduce your book and stuff like that? Yeah, yeah, I'd love to. Cool. So yeah, my name is Jo and uh, I think my story starts probably when I was about 16 years old. Um, you know, I struggled a bit at school. I was in the UK, I would probably say um, the terminology we use is a C grade student. So I was a very middle of the road student, um, always managed to sort of get by, you know, had good friendship groups. And um, when I left school, I, I, you know, I wasn't sure what I wanted to do when I was 16, 17 years old. And I think, you know, a lot of people at that age don't know what they want to do and actually as parents and you'll also find just adults in general will always be quizzing you what are you going to do when you're older you know what's your what's your passion and you feel this immediate bit of pressure you know some people do have it figured out they know exactly what they want to do they want to be a teacher a lawyer a firefighter a vet they might know what they want mm -hmm. to do but for i think i think for a lot of people they you know we're, we're, we're on this journey of finding our path and finding our passions and I really loved English and drama. They were my two passions. Um, but when I was 16 years old, my brother, who's four years older than me, called Richard, um, decided he was going to get into the mobile phone market. Now, bearing in mind, this was the early 1990s. People weren't really buying mobile phones on a big scale then. Um, so obviously, I was thinking, is this really going to catch on? You know, <laughs> But mm -hmm. the way the market has been, him inviting me to sort of run a business with him, which probably sounds a bit crazy. So I'm 16 and he's 20. We were very young entrepreneurs, um, mm -hmm. sort of fumbling our way through, trying to trying to create a business in the technology sector. I mean, absolutely, it was the right decision getting into that sector. Oh, but yeah. we also were really trying to navigate our path. And for me personally, as a young woman in tech, which we'll come into, um, I'm sure, in the podcast a bit later on, um, I always felt like I stood out a little bit because, you know, a lot of people that were around me at the time were all male, including my brother. Um, but I think I didn't really have those sort of role models around me of trying to help me to learn and to navigate. And and then when you start recruiting staff, you all of a sudden, are, uh, you know, are turned into a leader and you're supposed to be leading other people as well as trying to lead yourself at also a very young age. Mm -hmm. um, so that was a real long journey of of learning really and and still going now my brother and i've worked together for 27 years that company is called active digital and and i love it i love what i do uh, we're an apple mm -hmm. partner we're one of only nine direct apple partners in the uk and i and i love being a woman in technology and a woman in stem and you know i follow people like cheryl sandberg and people who really stand up for for this community of 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 helping role models be be around our young people and when I had my daughter, she's going to be 13 this year, um, I had my daughter and, you know, running your own business, you don't really get a lot of time off. And um, I was not only trying to navigate running my own business, but also trying to learn how to be a, a mother and a, and, and a parent. And, um, you know, when she was about three years old, I used to drop her at, at childcare. And I felt guilty about it because she would cry when I left her. And I thought, oh, how am mm -hmm. I supposed to navigate this trying to be an entrepreneur and, and and looking after all my people and also trying to be a what I would class as a good mum and be there for my daughter. So I found myself just Googling one night 
the top I put mum guilt as a topic to see what would come up because I felt like I was riddled with these emotions that I hadn't really had before. And to my surprise, Matt, nothing really came up. And I thought, why why are people not having these conversations about these right. emotions? Because I knew I knew that I wasn't really alone. Um, because there's a lot of working parents out there, mums and dads, who, you know, want to spend more time with their kids, but equally trying to sort of run a business or earn a living and just trying to do a good job at, at both and sometimes feeling like we're failing. So I decided to start a blog called Guilty Mother. It was a bit of a play on words. My husband mm -hmm. thought it was quite funny. And it's all about trying to feel not guilty or trying to feel trying to feel not so guilty and let those feelings sort of wash over you because everything that you feel is completely normal. And sometimes you just need someone to come up to you and say you're doing a really good job or you're doing the best that you can. You just need to cut yourself some slack. But we but we don't tell each other that enough, I think. And also mums just really benefit from hearing that from someone. Um, so I created the blog guiltymother.co.uk and that's now followed by about 55,000 people and I only started writing it as really a cathartic outlet. It wasn't supposed to be anything else. So it ended up turning into something that I wasn't expecting, which is wonderful when that happened. So I had an immediate audience then yeah. of parents, mums and dads, um, who, you know, I write about um, finding your entrepreneurial flair. I write about parenting, lifestyle, travel flying with kids, that sort of stuff, and get to work with amazing brands, really, like Jaguar mm -hmm. Land Rover and uh, Neutrogena. I partner with them for over a year. So the blog has been great. And again, I've then got more work for to do because I'm trying to run my business and I'm also trying to write a blog at, in the evenings around my children. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, as a mum of three, I, I think I just felt a lot of responsibility, really, of sort of sharing some of this journey with them. And, um, you know, I've had a lot of time to sort of reflect now of what it means to sort of, you know, be in business, but also to be a parent. And and it's OK not to have everything figured out all the time. And and the more I thought about my role potentially as a leader and a, and a role model, I wondered what this means for our next generation. And particularly for me as a woman, I thought, what does it mean for our next generation of girls coming into my 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 sector? Mm -hmm. And so I put myself forward as a speaker, Matt, and I started just about 10 years ago now, just going into schools, colleges and universities and talking about what I do. And I call it the briefcase story because I started at 16 years old with this little trusty briefcase. I've got a mm -hmm. picture of me as a four year old with a trusty little briefcase. There's a really nice <laughs> story. And, and I'm sure you'll agree with this, and, and especially because you're so passionate about books. But we learn so much through storytelling. So yeah. I go into I go into schools and I I join I join an assembly or stand in front of a room of a hundred students of all different types of all different ages, and I talk to them about this C grade student who became an entrepreneur who now then became an an international author and how do you do that? And so you know I I love sharing my story and then I wondered how I could maybe try and package this into a book because I could reach a lot more children quicker um, through the power yeah. of the pages really. So mm -hmm. because it takes so much time to go to different schools, um, I managed to get myself a publishing deal with DK, which I'm still incredibly proud of. Yeah. And and I really wanted to try and package all of this, this stuff that was in my mind of how I want to try and help our next generation. Um, and I wanted to write the book. And this is something you picked up on on, on some of your feedback, of the book, which is great. I just wanted to write it as 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 Joe and also as a, as a mum and 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 my own experiences, then bringing all of those contributors because I've got lots of books that sit on my shelf, whether they're written by doctors and psychologists and people that are you know really really bright and intelligent and can look at things on so many different types of levels. But I did want to re bring it all the way down. You can pick up any chapter in any order because again, it's for busy people. And whether you've actually got girls, boys, nieces, nephews, godchildren, or actually your best friend's got a daughter that you always like to keep an eye out for her and you've got her back. You know, this book is for, for everybody, really. And I've had some great compliments from people that have got sons to say, look, I've got I've got sons, but so much of it is really relatable. Mm -hmm. But this book was really needed. And again, I'm sure we'll come into the detail of why. Um, but it's called Rides of the Curl because we need to, we need to spend some time bringing our girls through. In some respects, you might think 
you'd wish the book wasn't needed because the girls are in a great place and their mental health are in a great place and they're putting their hand up in class and they're putting themselves forward for promotions and new jobs and that you know but we have these challenges there's a not to say that it doesn't happen in boys because it does and it will but it seems more prevalent in girls this these feelings of perfectionism the, the, the mm. fear of failure seem quite overwhelming to the point where it deserves its own book and this mm -hmm. is where rise of the girl was was born uh, and i love it am i i'm allowed to be in love with my own book i think yeah. i just love what it stands for for sure yeah i mean that's like such a good description of like the book itself and like what you do, where you came from. Uh, I know you described that a little bit in the book and I, I totally agree that stories are like the driver of uh, inspiration and the driver of like uh, being able to remember what we read. And uh, so I think you did a really good job with uh, putting that together and uh, getting that message across. And uh, like the purpose of your book really stands out as well. It's clear, it's bright, and uh, that makes it much easier to, to read through because the, the reader can really uh, understand what you're trying to get at. And um, so, yeah, the, the purpose is fantastic. So thank you very much for, uh, for writing it for, for us, parents and uh, teachers and aunts and uncles, and as you say, Pretty much uh, anyone who interacts with kids, I think, would benefit from it. Yeah, I really hope so. You know, I'd love to have the opportunity to write one for boys. I think that would be, you know, that would be a little bit out of my comfort zone. It's another topic that I talk you know, a lot about in the book. But I've got two sons and I, you know, I'm thinking about how am I raising them? But this book needed to come first. A, because I am a girl. So, of course, I'm going to write it from the heart and I'm going to go back mm -hmm. and remember that young Joe and the challenges that I felt I had. And one of the challenges that our girls are still facing in 2022 and, and, and mm -hmm. what are we what conversations can we have just to make some small changes that could actually have a big impact for our girls? And, and that's what I wanted to do with the book. Right. There are so many. Uh, I agree. There are so many issues right now uh, still, you know, with equality and like. Uh, I even see it at the school that I teach at, you know, like uh, where sometimes people make gendered remarks and stuff like that. And it's like, OK, well, yeah, I mean, we don't need to make those remarks because it really puts people down, I think. And uh, so I think that's one of the topics that you also talk about in your book as well. Like, uh, I think I remember the story, what sport was your daughter playing or something? You, you had a story about that in your book, right? I did, I did. Yeah. It was my daughter plays rugby. She's, yeah. Um, yeah, she's played rugby since she was five. And, you know, she got comments from other girls saying, you know, you can't play rugby, you're, 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 you know, you're not strong, you're, you're weak and you're too mm -hmm. small and, and all of those comments. But actually, rugby is an amazing game for, for children of, every shape and size and height you can possibly imagine there's a there's a spot for you um and even recently actually when she was at school um she was playing rugby with a friend of hers and the friend she was playing with actually is in her is in her rugby squad as well mm -hmm. um they passed the ball to to one of the boys and he wouldn't give it back to them and these are you know these are 11 year old kids at the time and they said give us give us the ball back and he said girls don't play rugby Hmm. and it really got their back up and they said we play we play for our local team just just give us the ball and he refused to but hmm. the girls wouldn't give up and in the end they went and got another boy who they actually play in the same squad because it's a mixed squad they went and brought him over and they said lucas can you tell william that we all play rugby and we all play rugby together hmm. at our local team and lucas said William, just give them the ball. They're actually really good rugby players. I play with them every Sunday. They're really good. They're really good players. You know, why, why are you being like this? And William did give them the ball back in the end. But what was quite interesting is that um, William did actually apologise um, the next day, which also is really important because mm -hmm. all of us make mistakes and mess up. But, you know, for, for, you know, there are people out there that don't even think that girls and women even play rugby. You know, that's why we need to make sure that through the power of media, there's that sport is is more equal because there are some yep. amazing athletes up there, male and female, but we're just not, we haven't been showing them enough. Yeah, um, to the point where William doesn't think that she deserves to even hold the rugby boy in her hands, which is wrong. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. And when I was reading through that story, it rem reminded me of my uh, daughter, who's also she's playing a uh, football right now, football, soccer. Uh, yeah. 
the American people are listening. <laughs> uh, she's playing football. She and it's a mixed group, and I think it's fantastic because the kids are still so young. So it's very impressionable on them to that you know everybody can play any type of sport or do any type of job. Um, and uh, I think that's also another point in your book uh, that I would like to bring up is the idea of role models. Uh, it's not a new idea, right? But like, uh, I think right now it's, it's changing, especially with uh, social media and stuff like that. So can you explain a little bit about how we can take advantage of this role model idea for empowering girls? A hundred percent. So role models are so important for for our young girls. And like you say, role models can be in everyday life. They can be they can be everywhere. They could be inside your home. They could be outside your home. They could be through your phone. And um, and you know, having good role models around around our children is just so important. And it's good to think. It's good to get your daughter to really reflect on who's around them at the moment because actually you can be a role model without even realizing it i'm sure my daughter is a role model for her two younger brothers even though she doesn't always recognize it they they're watching all the time matt they watch her they copy her even though she's sometimes oblivious but it can t it can put pressure on you can't it and as parents mm -hmm. they the kids they are always watching so you know, being being a good role model, whatever that definition of good is, is just you know think about how you're speaking to your children, think about who is around your children, and one of the biggest things that I say to my daughter is, who are you surrounding yourself with at the moment, and are are those people lifting you up? Have they got your back? You mm -hmm. know, are they giving you that positive energy that you need? Because sometimes it, we need to stop and pause and recognize, even even like for us as adults, who's around us at right. the moment, who is, is, is being impactful in our life. And it could be, it could be a, it could be a football soccer coach. Uh, it could be a family friend that's really having a really positive impact. Um, but it's, it's, it's really good maybe to stop and, and ask your daughter to potentially name two or three people um, that she feels are quite influential in a really positive way for her. You know, who are those people? It might be a teacher that just gets them. We love that when that happened, that teacher, she, oh, yeah. she gets me, she understands me, you mm -hmm. know? And it could be that there's just a connection. I, I remember Erin had a year where, you know, her teacher happened to be the netball coach, which was amazing. So like they had, they got an instant connection because they both love sports so that they can talk about that around, you know, around their, around their school day. Um, but role models are more important than I think we ever imagined. And I never saw myself originally as a role model until somebody approached me about saying, you need to go into schools and you need to share your story with other children because it's not about saying i want to be like joe but it's saying i can show what what is potentially possible and i can show them that you don't have to be a straight a student to to you know to to have a fantastic career or or an, you know mm -hmm. a, a successful future you make the success that you want to and when you find the things that you're really passionate about you can turn them into possibilities and that's that's when the greatness really starts mm -hmm. so making sure your children are surrounding themselves with people that really lift them up and help them to get the best out of themselves is really important and actually if somebody is giving you quite a lot of negativity all you need to do is just sort of try and step away from that situation and sideline yourself from that situation you don't have to have even a conversation with them really you just need to think I'm not getting a good energy from this person. I don't know if I want to be around them as much as, as I used to. And that's right. okay. Yeah, right. Definitely. And, you know, sometimes, uh, sometimes kids, they don't necessarily know. And I think that's why it's important for us parents to, to keep an eye out about, like, who are our kids hanging out with? And, uh, you know, are these actually really good people? I mean, we cannot really choose the friends, right? But we can maybe choose the situations that, uh, that we put our kids in, like uh, clubs and stuff like that. And maybe you mentioned something about that in your book, I think, possibly, <laughs> if I'm recalling correctly, right? <laughs> so we can choose, like, the, the clubs and stuff that, that, are, that our kids uh, join and. Uh, the people, the friends that are around them constantly really do influence them, I think. 
just yeah, like it does so for it us adults too. Yeah, a hundred percent. And and I think that's why it's good to have that conversation again. It's all around the conversations with your daughter, mm. with you, and it, and it, and just asking them about who they're you know who they're hanging around with a lot with at the moment, and and how those people sort of make her feel, um, and and it really helps them to think actually. I don't know. Every time I'm with that person, they're just always saying something like, oh, I don't like rugby or I don't like this. I don't like that. And it's just a lot of negativity. And I'm like, oh, OK, well, you know, how does that make you feel? So it's just sort of, you know, it brings you down a bit, doesn't it? So mm -hmm. how can you how can you change that situation or, you know, maybe what's going on, what's going on for that person? Maybe maybe they need some help and support because it's just they're in a really negative mindset, you know. Right. Um, so how do how do we help them? Because often when people are, you know, reflecting stuff onto you, it's not, I always say to Erin, it's not about you, it's about that person. Mm -hmm. What's going on for them? Because they're just offloading a lot of stuff onto you because they've got some, they've got some pain at the moment that they're experiencing. So where yeah. is that coming from? What, what yeah. help do they need? I said, it's not about you. Yeah. Don't take things personally. The four agreements, which you also <laughs> mentioned in your book. Yes. One of my favorite books. One of your favorite books too. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I love it. <laughs> yeah, great, great book. Great rule to follow for sure. Um, I always follow it. I always remind myself of those four agreements. And uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, they're they're really good agreements to follow in our life. So um, I've also got a question about uh, like this concept at school. Like uh, you mentioned about grades, of course, like a C student could do very well. Uh, after school, uh, but sometimes people label students as either smart or or dumb, and this can be quite difficult for kids. I think uh, to get this this idea in their head that they're smart or they're dumb. I mean, it's like kind of like black and white sometimes at school, and uh, it's not. It shouldn't really necessarily be like that, right? So. Um, how would you counteract this notion of smart? Oh, it's a really good question because, yeah, what is the definition of smart? And actually what you'll <laughs> tend to find is you might think you're smart, but then there's somebody else that's way smarter than you and somebody that's way smarter than them. So how far do you go? But what mm -hmm. I wrote about in the book was this, this, this table of different types of intelligences. You might rem remember that in the book. Oh, yes. And, I, and it's one of my favorite sections of the book because when you're thinking about intelligence well and and being smart where well, you could be you know work smart you could be creative smart you could be logical smart you could be you could be uh, when you think about athleticism you know you could be you could be you could that could be your intelligence and your strength mm -hmm. so i don't think we have to define our intelligence by one thing and just because i didn't get top grades doesn't mean that i can't deliver great talks for people and and you know wrote a book and Mm -hmm. and delivered that sort of stuff. So I think for people to to buy the book and have a look at the different type of intelligences, I you know the, the, this circle of of you know even, not even defining who you are, but just thinking, look out, you know, think outside of the box and don't just put yourself in a box of how smart I am. You don't need to do that. Right, right, yeah, and I, I think that would actually be a good visual to show the your kids, like especially if they're teenagers like they can already understand that concept and the visual in your book is very clear uh multiple intelligence dr howard gardner, gardner right? yeah uh definitely I, I think that would be a useful tool to show kids because uh then they could realize that hey you know yeah school we get graded we get scored uh but this doesn't determine our this doesn't define our intelligence, right? So uh, that's a huge lesson that, you know, parents can pass on to their kids for sure. And uh, yeah, so thanks for including that in your book as well, because uh, yeah, it's, it's such a useful tool. More kids and more parents need to, to kind of study that and uh, realize that, hey, we're capable of many more things than just academics, right? Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And obviously, like you being, a, you said a C student, right? Uh, yeah. You've started your own company when you were 16. You wrote your book, you're doing speeches. I mean, 
uh, I was also not like a, you know, high achieving student as well. And uh, I'm doing a lot of great things. So definitely the, the scores at school do not define you. <laughs> no, yes, no, definitely. no. And, 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 you know, don't get me wrong. I always want my children to do their best. I, you know, yeah. I want them to, I want them to progress. I want them to work hard and, you know, I want them to come out with the, whatever is their best grade on the day. Um, but most of all, what I want to do is I just want to praise them for their effort and, and not always the end result. And, you know, my son came home from school last term with the progress award and I couldn't be prouder. It doesn't mm -hmm. mean he's acing every, every test, but he's working so hard and trying his best, whatever his best is that day. And that's good enough for me. Mm -hmm. um, but like you say, put him outside. He's in the A team of everything. He's, you know, doing some great, um, great, great goals in his his matches, and and he's he's acing it out there. Yeah. So let's let's not let's not put him in a box, but let's let's keep praising him for progress. Yeah, yeah. It's always about the effort and the hard work, rather than. Uh, I think it's the intrinsic and the extrinsic, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yes. absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, <laughs> and the that's another mindset. great thing to talk about. Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, Carol Dweck, she's just, you know, Steve Backley, who's an Olympic athlete, he's in my book, became a very good friend of mine. He introduced me to Dr. Carol Dweck's book about 10, 15 years ago, and he said, you should read her book. And that was, I think, the first starter of me thinking, goodness me, mindset is everything, isn't it? And, it, and it, is how, it is how we grow as individual. And even for you, Matt, as a, a lifelong learner, you just keep soaking it in and you never want to stop because you want to keep growing to become your whatever your personal best is. You know, just keep developing yourself and growing your, your, mm -hmm. your, own, your own sense of self. And I, and I love that because when you finish school, so many of us think, oh, thank goodness for that, I'll put my books down. <laughs> but that's not the case. We are lifelong learners. Yes. We're always learning, you know, as individuals, as parents and for our kids, you know, there's just there's there's so much we can we can take in to keep to keep you know that knowledge growing all the time. You know, mm -hmm. life is life is fascinating. There's just there's so for much sure. to learn. For sure. And we show by example as well. Like my daughter sees me reading all the time. She doesn't necessarily like reading yet, but I hope that by you know seeing me read and uh uh, doing good things and stuff like that, that that will pass over to her as well. Um, so yeah, we definitely oh, show by example. We definitely yeah, show I, by I'm example. sure it will. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and even, you know, for my kids, they don't always like reading, but actually what parents can do if they've got reluctant readers, um, just say, right, let's grab a book and I will read to you. And, you know, just when you lay with them on their bed and you might read three or four pages. And I think to myself, why am I reading to him? He should be reading to me. <laughs> but you see their face and they start yawning. And actually, it's very, it's, it, you know, it's very relaxing either when you're reading or somebody's reading to you. And reading together is, is great. So actually, parents shouldn't beat themselves up, whether they're reading on their own or you reading to them. It's, it's good enough. Um, yep. so I'm trying, I'm trying to do that a little bit more, even though we think we're all so stretched for time anyway, but I'm like, no, I'm going to try and read a few, just a few pages for him. And hopefully it might encourage him to read a couple of pages on his own once I've left, you know, for so sure. you've got, you got to start somewhere. For sure. Yeah. I think, uh, I also remember just like an alternative mention here, uh, when I was probably about 10 or 11 years old, uh, I remember I didn't necessarily like reading too much. Uh, but I, I would get like audio books and that that's actually yeah. a, a good option as well. So I would sit there at, at night before going to sleep, I would just put my headphones in and I would yeah. click on that at that time. I think it was a tape, but, oh, well, anyway, <laughs> a cassette tape, but, uh, yeah, uh, I would just listen to audio books and that was fun. And I think that helped me to, to grow as a, a learner, um, even though I wasn't reading the physical book as a kid. So uh, yeah, yeah no, that's I, another option. I think, yeah, schools in the UK here, they say even, uh, well, the schools that I've spoken to anyway, they say, you know, even they're, even if they're not willingly picking up physical books all the time, audio books are still fantastic. So yeah. they can still listen. They can still, still listen through, through the power of audio. Yeah, 
that is definitely a good option so for sure hopefully we can get more children to read i'm like well to my kids i'm like guys your mum's an author how can you not be reading <laughs> yeah just read what you're interested in it doesn't matter whether it's fiction or non-fiction exactly. right yeah. yeah uh the kid like just pay attention to what your kids really love and then maybe go out and buy a book for them or something right exactly. that matches exactly. with their interests if it's not interesting for them they're probably not gonna read it <laughs> yeah uh cool so um uh there was another quote that kind of caught my interest in your book uh it's not exactly quoted here from your book but uh it's something like don't focus on what's wrong instead focus on what's going well and i find that a lot of educators and probably a lot of t uh sorry a lot of teachers and a lot of parents focus way too much on what's not going right and they don't focus enough on what actually is like what is the kid doing really well at so uh mm. can you yeah maybe expand on this point yeah no i think that's great and you probably noticed through the book i talk quite a lot about successes and failures and and the methods of both of those in general and i think one of the things that we perhaps don't do enough as adults is when we're talking to young people we don't, let's say that a young person has seen, you've been quite successful, for example, Matt, they don't often see the journey of how you got to where you are now, because mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure there would have been some bumps along the way, because there always is within many, most careers, I would probably say. So when you look at a successful person and you think, oh, wow, it looks just, looks, you know, Matt's just here and he's obviously doing really well. Um, but they, they don't see some of those bumps in the road and they don't get to see any of the failures that you've maybe had to overcome in order to get to where you are now. Mm -hmm. So I think I think as parents and caregivers, it's really important that we talk more about that journey, which is where we come back to the storytelling is really, really good and really powerful. And um, but also talk to, talk, talk to, you know, talk to them about when episodes of when we failed and how we overcome came that to, to get to where we are now. Because mm -hmm. Because of the pressure that young people are on now, I think one of the things is if they if something's not going right for them, it feels like the end of the world. But I suppose what we have to do is show them that this is just the hurdle that they'll have to overcome. And it's this is how we build the resilience in our children. You know, they didn't mm -hmm. get that grade that they wanted. They didn't meet the team. You know, your daughter's doing trials for her next team and she didn't get that, the spot that she wanted. And it hurts. And, and this is all part of of growing up and getting older. And we all remember those feelings of pain when you know we got cut from a team or we didn't get what we want. And actually stamping our feet and having our toys out the pram doesn't seem to solve much. It maybe it feels like it does at the time, but we've got to think, OK, well, what can I do to change the situation or what can I do to overcome this situation? Now, my daughter, as you as you probably saw in the front of the book, has been a massive inspiration for me. So when, again, when we go back to talking about role models, role models don't necessarily need to be older than you. You know, my mm -hmm. daughter is a great role model for me because she mm. just she'll just try stuff and just give something a go without even being afraid of failure or anything. She'll just say, mm -hmm. I want to try archery, I want to try fencing. And, and actually, recently, um, there's a couple of stories I'll, I'll share with you in a minute, but just recently she went forward for to play cricket for her county. Um, so not for that, you know, you've got county and then the one up from that is England. So you play for county and then if you go, if it goes well, you'd potentially play for your country. That's a big thing, right? Mm -hmm. She's only 12 years old. And they took 175 girls in our region to go for cricket trials. Mm -hmm. And they started to whittle them down and whittle them down. And she got down to the final 30 and they took 27 of them and she didn't make the cut. Oh, yeah. now that hurts, right? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. that hurts. But the daughter that I have just turned around and said, I'm so damn proud of myself for how well I did. And I'm and I'm going to try again. Oh, yeah. That's great. So she didn't, <laughs> she didn't throw her cricket bat and have a huff. And that I don't know if I was like that when I was her age, Matt, you know, so mm -hmm. calm and collected. And yeah, she was gutted. And she was upset. But she she wasn't, you know, she, she just said, I'm going to try again. And she will, 
she's already learning that resilience of how to pick herself up when she falls, you know. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, there's another sort of great story that I'd love to share with you, which is when she was playing rugby. Uh, I can't remember actually if I highlighted it in the book or not, but it's one that I talk about when I go out and do my talks in schools. So um, she was playing rugby from a young age, as I mentioned, and when she was about seven years old, um, she was playing for this local club. And um, you'll love this, Matt. The coach came up to me. There was a, a lot of boys, you know, probably a bit like your soccer. It's a lot of boys, and then you've mm -hmm. got a, a nice little group of girls. But but for rugby, there's not many. And in fact, there was only you could probably count them on your hand at one stage. And yeah. the coach came up to me and he said, "Joe, something fantastic has happened at the club, and I'd love to talk to you about it." And I said, "Oh, okay. What's what's happened?" And he said to me, Matt. He said, "The first, what well, the first time." This is well, this has never happened, but he said for the first time uh, in 100 years, which is the history of the club, we have enough girls to put an under seven team together. Mm. An under, under seven girls team. We've never had enough girls in 100 <laughs> years. Ah, Can you yeah. believe that? Yeah, that's so awesome. They, they, it's awesome. So he mm -hmm. said to me, Joe, I know you, you know, you do a few things with female empowerment and stuff. So he said, I thought I have to mention it to you because he said, if I didn't mention it, you'd never forgive me. Because he said, we've never had this happen before where we've had enough girls. And I said, amazing. What are you going to do? And he said, well, with your blessing and hopefully the other parents are okay with this, I would love to take the girls to their own festival. They'll play their own festival, which is a tournament, basically. Um, and they'll just have a girls team we've say we haven't done that before and i thought it was a great idea so there was quite a lot of hype around the club and uh, they took these girls to the to the festival mm -hmm. and they played four matches that day and they lost three and won one and um you know i remember thinking oh yeah you know she won the last one so hopefully i'll try and be like yay well done girls but mm -hmm. she was erin was quite down about it because they felt like they they hadn't you know they hadn't come away as 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 winners they hadn't been successful whatever that mm -hmm. looks like so she was quite down the next morning she came down to breakfast matt and she said to me mom i figured out why we didn't win i said okay seven years old what have you what have you figured out she said, well, we just didn't really come together as a team and we didn't play as a team. And she said, you know, Molly and Cordelia, they're really good at tagging. We have this, they wear these sort of rugby tags. She said, they're good at tagging in the middle, so defending. Mm -hmm. Iris and I are quickest up the wing, so we score the tries. But she said, we didn't play like that. We just were just a bit all over the place and we didn't, we didn't play to our strengths. Mm -hmm. And I thought this was brilliant from this young girl that was standing in front of me. And um, fast forward a couple of months, the coach decided that they would go back to the same festival to play that tournament again. And then once again, they played four matches. They'd really worked together as a team and, and worked over these last couple of months. And they won three matches and lost one. So actually, oh. when they played to their strengths and learn how to overcome failure and how to overcome that loss, they, it was the complete reversal of their first experience and they came away feeling like champions mm. but they can only do that if they work to their strengths and i think there's some there's some really good sort of learning tools that we can that we can take away from that story mm -hmm. um and, and it's important that people know that they almost had to lose in order to win so they right. had to they had to lose their first tournament in order to regroup and, and I think we have this in business as well, don't we? Like you lose a contract or a contract is vulnerable. We have to regroup. We have to come together and think, guys, what's going on? What's wrong with this client? Why are they upset? Why are they considering leaving? What are we going to do? How are we going to turn this around? And we learn so much, don't we, on the pitch, on any sport, whether it's yeah. baseball or soccer or rugby or cricket. We learn so much of when things are going great, brilliant. But when they're not, how how do you turn that around? And I think... I can't remember what the stats are, but I know in the in the US, particularly, all of the Fortune 500 businesses, if they, you know, if they're running their own organisations, there's an over 90% chance that they did sport through high school and through college because oh, yeah. all of those lessons that you learn on the pitch are so translatable into work, aren't they? Yeah, yeah, I believe so too. Yeah, definitely. And I, I love, I love the fact that your daughter was very reflective. That's so cool like because that's such a uh, 
very powerful skill to have and develop at such a young age, this metacognition type of thinking about thinking and reflecting on, hey, what, what went wrong? What can I do better next time? Such an important skill to, to have for everyone in any field. And exactly. of course, I, yeah, failure I is, is a great teacher. <laughs> oh, sorry, what? I said, I don't even know where she gets it from. I don't know if she even gets it from me. This is what I'm saying. She's she's a role model for me. I just don't know. The things she comes out with sometimes are amazing. I'm sure I'll have a stroppy teenager on my hands quite soon. But at the moment, she's, yeah, no, we're, you know, we're, we're getting on really well. And, and again, it's just these navigating these early years um, through winning, losing, success, failure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's, it's all part of the journey, I'm sure. Yeah. Definitely. Uh, so throughout throughout this conversation that we've had, uh, you, you've touched on a lot of the the seven conversation points that are in your book. I've noticed that when we were ta talking, but I didn't really mention it earlier. So uh, maybe just can you give a brief summary of what the seven uh, conversation points are to have with your daughter? Yeah, a hundred percent. So I can read them out to you actually. So. Yeah. The seven empowering conversations. So the first one, you like you say, I probably have touched on all of them. It's like it's ingrained in my mind. Uh -huh. Number one, I don't like putting my hand up in class. So you, there's two ways that you can think about this, whether it's a physical hand or like a virtual hand. And you can a virtual hand might be for the rest of your life. So as you start to go through life, you think, I want to take that opportunity. I'm just not sure how to put myself forward. So if we can teach our daughters particularly to put their hand up from a young age, um, whether it's answering a, a question in class or having an idea, don't be afraid to just share it. I think putting your hand up from a young age is massively important because that's how we're teaching our girls to put their hand up when they're going for that promotion in their 30s. And they're like, I'm just going to go for it. I don't know yeah. where this is going to take me, but I'm just going to go for it. And that's how we get more women at the board table. Mm -hmm. Number two, I can't do this. Other people do this. So I think sometimes when we look at people and we think, oh, my goodness, I don't know if I can do that or not, but I think we only really can explore things if we if we do stuff, give stuff a try. So, um, you know, I, this is a, these are all conversations that I've had with my own daughter, which is what I think makes the book so real. These are mm -hmm. you know, these are conversations that I have actually had with Erin. Um, so, you know, some of that conversation might be, I can't do this. Other people do this. Well, in most cases, she probably she probably can try to do something. But it's important just to think about how she can overcome that fear. But equally, she doesn't always have to be like other people. She can consider what, what she's doing. Um, the third thing is I really messed up today. What am I going to do? That's a conversation that we've literally just had overcoming failure. It's a massive piece of the book. Um, and I say I've just given you some examples there, which are great. So mm -hmm. um, moving on to number four, I'm rubbish at maths. Even my teacher thinks so. This, again, is something that my daughter has said. And we've got to reframe that criticism. I love talking about reframing. Um, mm -hmm. I picked up maths as an example because it's also it's quite a big topic. And sometimes when we talk about being smart, mathematics always tends to be in that conversation. Mm -hmm. um, but again, it's it's helping her to be maybe maybe maths might not be her strength, but actually what are your strengths and what are you good at? And actually, you know, as long as you've got a, a good level of maths, I'm sure she'll be fine. Um, mm -hmm. Number five, she's really awesome. I wish I could be more like her. The power of role models. I think, again, that's great. Um, how we identify them and how everybody can be a role model to somebody else, even without realizing it. You're right, Matt. I have literally touched on all yeah. of these. Yes. <laughs> Number six, why would she say that? I thought she was my friend. So we gave the example earlier of, of, of potential, you know, a friend actually saying to Erin, you can't play rugby. You are weak. You're not strong. You're too short. You know, all of that. Um, so dealing with the frenemy and yeah, how to handle mean girls. So there's some really great advice in there. Mm -hmm. uh, and number seven, the last one. We lost another game, maybe I should quit. Fail again, try again, how we teach perseverance. And yeah, we've had some good examples of that in this yeah. podcast. So. <laughs> yes, uh, you didn't even realize that you were talking about it, did you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, I was sitting here when you're talking about it. I'm like, okay, this uh, this sounds very familiar. It's uh, I think it's very much related to the seven conversations. <laughs> I think yeah. me and the book, we are as one. Uh huh. Yes, so. definitely. You've got it ingrained <laughs> in your mind. I have. I have. Yes. Well, you wrote it after all, so. <laughs> yeah. 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 All right. So um, what else would you like to add to this fantastic conversation? Uh, well, I just think, yeah, Rise of the Girl has been written for parents and caregivers of daughters, but equally, you know, for anybody that has a child in their life or a young person in their life, you know, please buy it because, of course, I'm completely biased, but I do think it's a really great, easy read, really uplifting, empowering and positive and that's what everybody needs right now and you'll definitely take away some some words of wisdom or some ideas whether it's walking and talking with your child just try and get them to open up a little bit to you we know that children's mental health is not in a great place even worse after after the pandemic and we need to we need to make some changes and, and help our young people and that's why i think the book is so relevant right now it deserves to stand strong on the shelves so please reach out and buy it it's also available on audible so uh, like we touched on earlier if you think oh i don't want to read the physical book just you know have it have have me in your ears for seven and a half hours i mean why wouldn't you want to do that um <laughs> you can also go and check out the blog guiltymothers.co.uk so please go and have a look there's some great content on there as well um if you have uh, a school college or university you're thinking whether it's in the uk or the states and you're thinking oh my goodness we would love to have joe come and talk to us let me know you know drop me a line if you're on instagram i'm at guilty mother i'm also on facebook at guilty mother i'm very happy to answer any questions that people have got um if they love the book please leave me an amazon review that's so important matt isn't it because i got told that's how people find you more so yeah for sure um, it's so it's so it's so useful if people take just a, a you know a couple of minutes just to say i really enjoyed this book i'm gonna i'm gonna leave a little note so you say literally just a couple of lines is is plenty but it really helps especially as i think new authors they really appreciate mm -hmm. the support which is why uh, when you reached out to me, Matt, I'm so grateful, and I'm I'm really pleased you you chose decided to choose my book with your parenting book of the month, um, yeah. and I'm glad that you read it and enjoyed it, and I really hope other people do as well. Mm -hmm. I really do as well too, because uh, hey, I support you, uh, I support every parent out there that you know. Hey, you gotta you gotta educate yourself, and you know, get all these ideas. I mean, there's there's no one way to parent, right? There's no one way to parent, um, but there is a way to gain ideas from all the authors out there that have published their books about parenting to really, uh, you know, um, <laughs> what am I trying to say here? To do uh, narrow your parenting skills. So I think that Rise of the Girl is a perfect uh, addition to your parenting bookshelf so uh definitely pick up a copy and um, i will also include links down below uh to the website that you mentioned and uh, amazon and, and your social media so everyone listening and watching uh check out those links down below and uh yeah thank you so much joe for coming on this episode really appreciate it thanks for having me yeah all right everyone Take care and uh, we'll see you in the next episode.